This is the 16th lecture for MA 1012 at University College Cork. In the last lecture, we talked about how to uh, relate matrices, uh, matrix multiplication, to linear systems of equations. In the previous lecture, we talked about how to carry out matrix operations like addition and subtraction and multiplication. So uh, now we want to think about matrix inversion, uh, which is the, the last step in producing a a system of, of algebraic um, operations on matrices. The first comment to make about matrice, matrix uh, inversion is that it's not always going to work. Um, whereas it, when, when we work with numbers, uh, every number like 3 has a number like 1 over 3, and it's reciprocal. So when you multiply them together, you get 1. 3 times 1 over 3 is 1. But um, that won't always work with matrices because it doesn't always it's not always possible to solve this sort of equation in matrices. Um, so uh, a square uh, matrix, a matrix A, is said to be invertible if it has an inverse, uh, which is a a square matrix, a square. Uh, matrix, uh, let's say B, so that A times B and B times A are both the appropriate size of identity matrix, whatever size A and B are. As a simple example, if A was the matrix 0, minus 1, 1, 3, and if we set B to be the matrix 3, 1, minus 1, 0, then you can check um, by multiplying out that A times B is also the same as B times A, and that they're both equal to the identity matrix. You have to try out both multiplications to check, to, to see if that one is the inverse of the other. You have to, at least so far, we have to check both multiplications out because we know that A times B and B times A are generally not the same thing. Um, so you can check and expand it all out and see that it works. But as a different example, um, we can consider we can consider a simple matrix, which is this uh, matrix D, which is let's say uh, zero, zero, minus one. Uh, uh, well, let's say no plus one, minus two. Um, that's what I have in my notes. Um, then um, it doesn't have an inverse because if you wanted to have an inverse A B C D. Um, you'd expand out, so here's D was, um, sorry, plus 1 and minus 2 um, times A, B, C, D. And if you try to calculate that out, you get 0 times this plus 0 times this is 0. So 0 A's plus 0 C's is 0. Expand that again by going this way along the row and this way down the column. I get zeros all the way along. Multiplied by anything it gives me zeros. And I don't need to work out the other entries. Um, so these could be anything, these little dots could be anything. All I've done is to compute out this times this and get a zero. And I already can see that that isn't going to work. There's no way that that could possibly equal the identity matrix, which you remember is ones down the diagonal and zeros off the diagonal. But those can't be equal because this one right here can't equal this zero right here. It doesn't work. So this doesn't have an inverse. It couldn't possibly have an inverse. So some matrices are not invertible. They don't have inverses. It's easy to see that the inverse, if it exists, is unique. Um, if A has two inverses, let's say C and D, um, then uh, A times C is C times A is the identity. But then A times D is D times A is the identity. And then what we can do is simply to work out that D is uh, D times the identity, but D times the identity is D times A times C, because A times C is the identity, and that's D A C. Um, but D times A is the identity, so that's C. And so D equals C. D here equals 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 C. So, um, so there's only one inverse if it exists. Um, there's a, another point to make here, which is the relationship to linear equations. We've been interested in linear equations, and we wrote them down as AX equals B, where this guy was the unknown. We had some unknown uh, vector X of 
of variables, our vector x looked like x1, x2, dot, 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 however many x's we need. And um, so how would we solve this? And what does that have to do with, with inverting linear equations, or with inverting matrices? So we've got this matrix A. If A inverse exists, and that's the notation we'll use for it, this is uh, the notation for an inverse, inverse uh, of A. We said there is only one if it exists. If it exists, we'll call it by this name, A to the minus one. If A to the minus one A inverse exists, then we could take the equation here. We want to understand what's the relationship between linear equation and inverse. Suppose there is an inverse. Multiply both sides by it, and you get A inverse AX is A inverse B. This equation becomes this one by multiplying both sides by the inverse. And you can go back again by multiplying both sides by A. So it's clear that these are equivalent. Um, so that's this. But the A and the A inverse knock each other out, and you simply get a X equals A inverse B. And of course, these are equivalent. So what we're saying is that there's an equivalent relationship between the, the linear equation with the unknown sitting in it, and this equation, which tells you what the unknown is. So in fact, if the inverse is out there, if there is such an inverse, it immediately solves for us all the linear equations, all linear equations that involve this matrix A as the, as the coefficient a matrix, they all immediately solve by just using that inverse. So if the inverse is out there and we can easily find it, we can immediately use it to solve systems of linear equations. Now there's a classical formula which you may have seen for two by two matrices uh, to find the inverse if it exists, and it's simply uh, explained as the following thing. If um, so, let's just look at the two by two case because that's simple enough. The one by one case, the inverse matrix is just a reciprocal number. A one by one matrix is a number. The inverse matrix is just a reciprocal number. But if we had a matrix A, which was let's say two by two A B C D, then uh, we defined the adjugate of A. It's either called the adjugate or sometimes called the classical adjoint, which is a bad name and should be avoided. Um, but some people like the term classical. Uh, classical adjoint, adjugate is probably the more common name these days. Um, and it's simply uh, D minus B minus C A. So after people worked with these things a lot, they could see that there should be an inverse and it should be related to this thing. Um, let's see what the relationship is between A and its adjugate. Um, if you multiply A by the adjugate of A, um, so you can compute that out, A, B, C, D is A. The adjugate is the same matrix, but with minus signs uh, on these entries and then these entries swapped. And if you multiply that, you get A, D minus B, C. And then here you get um, A times minus B and A times plus B, so you get zero. Here you get C times D minus D times C is zero because they're numbers, so they commute with each other. Those are just A, B, C, D are just ordinary numbers. And then this is minus B times C plus A times D, so we can write that as A, D minus B, C. So we get equals A, D minus B, C times the identity matrix, where here I is the two by two identity matrix. So we can see how to how to write out A times the adjugate is this guy. And then if we work out um, adjugate uh, of A times A, the computation is almost exactly identical. D minus B minus C A times A B C D equals D C minus D A minus B C, so A D minus B C. Now that's B times D, that's minus B times D, so zero. Minus AC plus AC is zero. Um, and then minus BC plus AD, so AD minus BC. And again, we get AD minus BC times the identity matrix. So we've discovered the surprising result that A times its adjugate has a nice expression in both situations, a multiple of the identity matrix. So you can divide that through. Um, so we'll define uh, for two by two, a, a two by two matrix, say with of the form A is A B C D, um, uh, the determinant of the two by two matrix A is defined to be A D minus B C, and we'll have to figure out what to do with that more generally later. Um, but what we've discovered is then the formula that A times the classical adjoint or adjugate is the adjugate of A times A is the determinant of A.
and therefore we find the formula for the inverse a inverse is exactly 1 over determinant a times the adjugate of a and we would like a formula like that in all dimensions but that's for at least for 2 by 2 uh, matrices that gives us a complete picture it also tells us that if there was going to be an inverse it would turn out that it would have to have a determinant um, a deter the determinant would have to be non-zero why because um, so if a inverse so this is this this works this is works if uh, the determinant of a is not zero you can then use the calculations above to justify that that is an inverse but if there is an, if there is an inverse if this inverse exists then we can simply write that um, that uh, that the adjugate of a uh, is the identity times the adjugate of a um, which is uh, a inverse times a identity is a inverse a times adjugate a and then uh, rearranging the parentheses you get a inverse times a times adjugate a so it's a inverse times what's this guy this guy we know is um, a times adjugate a is just determinant a times the identity um, so um, so we've got uh, uh, so that's a determinant a times a inverse um, in particular if uh, so if determinant a is 0 you get that the adjugate of a is 0 and that tells you exactly that a is 0 and so if there is an inverse this argument says if there is an inverse then um, you have to have a is 0 so there's no inverse and so that's a contradiction. And so what we've discovered is that, in fact, if the inverse exists, um, then the determinant of A is not zero. That's what this argument tells us. But this argument tells us that if a determinant is not zero, then the inverse exists. So we discover the following uh, result that from this argument we had here that the A inverse, if the determinant was non-zero, could be computed out by this expression. On the other hand, if the determinant, uh, if the inverse exists, the determinant can't be zero, and so uh, we get inverse exists if and only if the determinant is non-zero, and then this formula gives us the inverse. So at least for two by twos, we've got the big picture worked out. We know which matrices have inverses, the ones with non-zero determinant, and we know how to find the inverses by this explicit formula. So let's try this on a simple example to see how how we actually compute it. Um, so if we look at a simple example like um, A is, let's say, 6, 3, 4, 2, 2 by 2 matrix, then, um, well, then the determinant of A is the product down that way minus the product down that way. So it's 6 times 2 minus 4 times 3. 6 twos are 12. 4 threes are 12, so 0. And so there is no inverse because we said determinant 0 is exactly one that fails to have an inverse. Um, on the other hand, if we wanted to do another example, like let's say A is 3, 2, minus 1, 5, then the determinant of A is 3 times 5 minus minus 1 times 2, so 3 fives are 15. And then plus 2 is 17, so that's not 0. And so therefore, um, an inverse exists, and the inverse must be um, 1 over the determinant uh, times the adjugate. And so the determinant's 17, so 1 over the determinant is 1 over 17. The adjugate is given by swapping the A and D entries and changing the signs on the other entries. Um, so we can uh, compute that out. We just have to divide everybody by 17, so it's 5 over 17 minus 2 over 17, 1 over 17, and 3 over 17, giving us the determ the inverse of a matrix. And it's, so it wouldn't be obvious uh, how you would find the inverse of this thing who didn't have a formula. Now we have this nice formula here, uh, which we've used, and we know how to calculate out explicitly the adjugate and the determinant. So we, this not only handles two by twos, um, for higher matrices, it turns out there is still a determinant, there is an adjugate, 
but it turns out the determinant is, um, in general, for large matrices, unreasonably difficult to calculate. So it's not possible to to uh, use such formulas in, for very large matrices. Um, for somewhat small, smaller size matrices, it's impo still possible to use something like this. You have to define a determinant and adjugate. It still works, but it's quite a bit of work once the matrices get to be large. And so we need another approach. So let's think about an approach that might work more generally. We'll write down a theorem. Suppose we have A is an n by n matrix, and suppose R is the, let's do the reduced um, row echelon form of A. Then we want to claim uh, the following, our equivalent. Um, So this is what we want to prove, that um, there are all these equivalent formulations in invertibility. There are lots and lots and lots of them. Um, the first one is that A is invertible. So when I say the following are equivalent, I mean that any one of these statements is going to be true if and only if any of the other ones is true. They're true in exactly the same circumstances. So they're either all true or all false for any particular matrix. So the other statement is that R is the identity matrix, the n by n, let's say, identity matrix. Um, the third statement is that A has rank N, so it's full rank. It's an N by N matrix. The biggest rank you can have is N, and it has that. Um, the next one is that, um, sorry, what have I got here? Uh, have I missed one? Oh, I've missed one, yeah. Um, so one of them should, the number two should have been um, uh, AX equals zero has only X equals zero as solution and I guess that should have been two and that should have been uh, anyway <laughs> that should have been two um, that one should have been two anyway uh, okay so following the notes um, okay so then the next one is um, that uh, the next one is there is at at least one solution X unknown so the unknown vector to ax equals b um, for every vector b. b and of course b should be an n-dimensional in vector so in rn and um, we've got also the um, the columns form a basis columns of a form a basis of Rn. Uh, let's see, that should be the sixth. And then the seventh is that there is a matrix. There exists some, there, there is, let's write it this way, there is a uh, matrix C so that uh, C at times A is the n by n identity matrix. Okay, so those are various formulations of the same thing. Uh, again, when I say the following are equivalent, I mean if one of these things is true, then all of these things is true. If one of these things is false, then all of these things are false. Okay, so maybe best if I just say, because this was supposed to be 2, uh, this one was supposed to be 3, um, and this one was supposed to be 4, I think, to renumber them. Otherwise, I'll mess it up in the proof. Um, so I want to follow the notes carefully in the proof. So let's um, go through the steps of proving this result. Um, so we'll start off with uh, supposing that A is invertible. Um, uh, suppose A in, is invertible. Um, then we want to prove that that only A, that AX equals zero has only one solution. AX equals zero is exactly the same as multiplying both sides by A inverse. A inverse AX equals A inverse zero because when you multiply by A inverse, you can go back again by multiplying by A. So it doesn't change what the answers are. Um, but then the A inverse and the A cancel, and the A cancels the zero and gives you zero. A inverse times zero is zero. That's if and only if X is zero. So there you go. That's uh, one uh, implies two. Okay, so we've got one implies two. Now we need to do 2 implies 3. So um, suppose that AX is 0 if and only if X is 0. And now what we need to do is to look at the, at the row echelon form. 
but we know that um, if we write out uh, this equation ax is zero, it just consists of we write the equation the matrix A as having various columns. Um, then ax equals zero has uh, augmented matrix. Exactly a one dot 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 a and the columns of a, and then the big vertical sign and then the x. Uh, oh, sorry, then the zero, then the zero, not the x, uh, the zero. And so we already know that um, that the solutions is exactly x is zero has the existence and uniqueness of the solution exactly when there are pivots all the way down here, and therefore pivots all the way down. Um, so. Um, this occurs exactly when we have pivots all down, uh, all the way down. It's a pivot at every single step to solve for every single variable, and that means the pivots. Once you do the the, the Gaussian elimination algorithm, at each step you get a pivot, and then you kill everything underneath it, and you get a pivot, you kill everything above it, and underneath it, you get a pivot, you kill everything underneath it and above it, um, and so on and so forth. The pivots march all the way down, giving you zeros everywhere here your big vertical bar, your zeros here, which never change in any of the steps. And so that's just uh, exactly identity matrix zero. And that's the row R where we're talking about it in the statement that was our, that's our reduced row echelon form is just the identity matrix. Um, similarly, uh, I won't do all the steps, three implies four um, and um, so that's uh, that's not hard to show. Uh, it's similar to that one, um, and uh, four implies five, and five implies six are essentially the same as things we've already done about uh, about solving linear systems of equations. F well, finally, let's suppose we want to relate linear equations to inverses. Suppose so. We want to show that um, we want to show that. Uh, I want to show that uh, five implies. Uh, uh, let's see. I'll just flow. So flow that um, suppose that a x equals b has um, uh, at least one solution. For each b, then what you're going to do is you're going to try to solve. Um, to solve a x equals the standard basis vector e1. Remember e1 is supposed to be the, the vector with a 1 and then a whole bunch of zeros. Uh, a x equals e2 and so on. It gives the vectors, so we'll let that be x1, x2, and so on. And then we can simply let c be the matrix of x1, x2, dot, 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 xn, and that'll turn out to be an inverse. A times, well, sorry, A times C is the identity, is the easy bit to check because that's exactly A, A times C means A times each row, uh, each column, each times each column of C, and that's the columns, and they satisfy these equations, and so you get the identity matrix. Um, and uh, so then, then, then I'll leave you to check the other, the other direction, and we'll do some more of this later. We haven't done every step. Of the of the story, that's that's not a complete finished proof, but it gives you at least some parts of the proof, and we'll get more parts put together later. Um, now, this this theoretical result is important as a means of having different ways of checking whether or not inverses exist, but um, but it doesn't uh, immediately uh, strike us as giving an algorithm to find. So, how do we find a inverse for um, reasonably large? A, we only know how to do it for one by ones and two by twos at the moment. How do we do it for larger um, A's, larger than two by two? Um, what we can do is we can solve these. So we can solve these equations: a x one is e one for an unknown x one, and so on and so forth. A x n is e n for an unknown x n, and we we'll put them all together and make a matrix, which is the x ones and the x n's all put together, and that'll be C is. C will turn out to be a inverse if a inverse exists, and um, and then the equations uh, you can't solve some of them if a inverse doesn't exist by the previous theorem, which we haven't completely finished proving. So um, 
so that's the that's the, the the basic story that you have to solve all those equations all at once. So we know how to solve one such equation. We'd write down uh, a, and then we'd write down e1, and that would help us to solve the first equation. And similarly, e, if we put e2 instead, we'll solve the second one. But can we solve them all at once? What we want to do is to solve all of them at once. Well, that's easy enough. What you do is you put a, and you put e1, e2, dot 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 dot, e in. And you want to solve all of them at once. What you do is reduce this to row echelon form, and it'll tell you what to do with the x's to solve this one, to do with and solve that one, and that one all at once. So in other words, if I do uh, um, uh, my reduced row echelon form uh, approach on this system, I'll end up with, well, a will become its reduced row echelon form, and then I don't know what happens to any of these. But if a inverse exists, um, then, uh, then according to what I said here, these become, uh, I get exactly these x's. I find that these, um, as a becomes the identity matrix, inverse exists, a will become the identity matrix in its row echelon form, and then these guys will become, uh, will spell out a inverse. So then you'll get the row echelon form of a, of a will be the identity matrix from our theorem. And then the process, all these will get transformed into the various x's that are exactly the columns of our of our inverse matrix. So to sum that up, another way to write that is simply to say if we put A and these guys which are all put together, all of them put together, form the identity matrix because those are the columns of the identity matrix, E1, E2, and so on. If you put all those columns together into one big identity matrix, you just put A on the left side of the bar and identity matrix on the right side. So now instead of just putting one column of constants, I'm putting many columns of constants uh, all at once, all the way, all over there. So not just one column of constants, but all of these columns forming the identity matrix. Then I'll go through the process of um, a reduced row echelon form so the Gaussian elimination um, process all the way through, and I'll end up at the identity matrix in A inverse, if A inverse exists, and, uh, and if A inverse exists, and I'll end up at not the identity matrix and junk. I don't know what that junk will be. They'll both be junk, but it won't be the identity matrix here if A inverse doesn't exist. That all follows from our theorem, because we've said that if you do the row echelon form, you're going to get the identity matrix exactly when this thing has an inverse. But then you do the row echelon by transforming the A into the identity. The process you're doing is actually multiplying by A inverse. That's got to go from A to the identity by multiplying by something, and it turns out to be multiplying by A inverse. And that means this guy gets hit by the same operations. It must be multiplied by the same thing, so it not surprisingly gets multiplied by A inverse. And it does follow from our theorem. It does follow that this is correct, that if A does have an inverse, it gets to become the identity matrix under the reduced row echelon, and this guy has to have its various columns have to be the columns of the identity matrix. And so that must happen if A inverse exists. But if A inverse doesn't exist, you get not the identity matrix, something something here that's not the identity matrix, and then something here that's junk that we don't really care about. Um, so, uh, so that's how we can tell if an identity matrix exists and find it. So let's see if we can do this on an actual example, um, because we like to have examples when we learn how to calculate with recipes like this. Um, so let's take a simple example of a simple matrix. So let's see if we can work out the inverse to a very simple matrix. Um, let's try 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1. Okay, according to our general result, what we do is apply, oh, these should be square. Um, um, so we apply the, the method to this thing. Um, A on the left-hand side and identity on the right-hand side. So that's our matrix A, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1. Then a bar, which we don't really need to keep track of, but we can if we like. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Where did I get that from? That's the identity matrix. 1's down the diagonal, 0's everywhere else. That's the identity matrix. So now what we're going to do is to try the, the, the process. Um, we start off with a pivot, uh, which is a 0. We're not allowed a 0 pivot, so we have to swap with the next row. And so we're going to do swap rows uh, 1 and 2. 
And so the next step, I won't write an equal sign. These two are not equal. They're different matrices, but uh, this is the next step in the in the Gaussian elimination process. I've got 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, because I've swapped. This is the second row. Now the first row becomes the second row. Why did I swap rows? Because there's a zero here, and I don't, I'm don't. i not allowed to use a zero as a pivot. So that would be my first pivot. I can draw the little red um, indicators of little boxes that indicate the pivots. So I start in this, always start in this corner, and you're not allowed to use a zero as a pivot, so that can't be, so it has to be swapped. So I swapped somebody else into place as that pivot, and that's my new pivot. And then the third row stays exactly the same, it didn't get swapped. All right, so there's our next step. Now what we need to do is to figure out how to get the pivot to kill everything under it. I have to get that guy to kill that guy, so I need to take minus one of this row added to that row. You need to indicate your steps. These little markers on the sides are indicating to me what I'm doing at each step. You need to somehow indicate your steps. The first row stays the same. The second row stays the same. The vertical bar stays the same. And the last row is getting minus this add to this is zero. Minus everything has to be done a row at a time. So I'm adding minus this row to this row, minus the first row to the third row. So that minus that to that minus that to that is one. And then minus that to that is still one. Uh, minus that to that is still zero. And then um, Minus that to that is minus 1. Minus that to that is 1. Okay, so there we have our next step. Now we need to, and our, again, I should keep my pivot. It's nice to keep it marked in red so I can see where the pivots are. Um, the next step should be that the new pivot should be generated here. You're supposed to go diagonally downward. When a six pivot successfully kills everything under it, you step diagonally downward. Um, but that's not allowed because a zero is not allowed as a pivot. So once again, we have to do some kind of swap to swap with a later row. Um, so we'll swap this into place as the next pivot, um, giving us uh, first rows unchanged. The second row and uh, third row are, are interchanged, so we should write down the third row here. And then write down what was the second row. Uh, what have I done? Uh, what was the say? Oh, sorry, um, I've done that wrong. Uh, zero minus one, one should be here. Okay. Um, and then what was the second row? Is this guy? Okay. So now um, our pivots, this guy and this guy. Okay. So the pivot has managed to successfully uh, uh, um, murder what was underneath it. So the the pivot's done its job, and so we now move. Um, downward and make a new pivot. Make a new pivot down here. It's our next pivot. And now we've got pivots all the way down. And now we have to get the pivots to kill what's above them, not just what's below them. So this pivot has to kill everybody above it. This pivot has to kill everybody above it. I'll start with the bottom pivot and get it to kill everyone above it. So I have to add minus this row to this row. And that will kill what's above this pivot. At the same time, I can also add minus um, of this row to, uh, sorry, not that one. I want to add, uh, let's do it in another step. So I'll just do minus this row to this one just to make it uh, clearer what I'm doing. Okay, so we'll just do that. So then um, that means the first row is unchanged. Second row gets minus the first, uh, minus the third row added to it. So uh, zero, one, zero. That's this add, uh, minus this to this, minus this to this is a minus one, and then those should be unchanged. Um, okay, and then the la the third row is unchanged. Um, okay, so that's the picture, and again the little pivot boxes, which are not drawn in lecture notes, which is fine. Um, you don't really need to draw them, but I think for me it makes it easier to see what I'm doing. Those are my pivots. They're killing everything. You can see there are three of them in the in this three by three. So that go, they do go all the way down the diagonal. So it is in fact an invertible matrix. So we can already see that at this point that it must be invertible. This matrix A we've 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 chosen uh, at the beginning. Let's see if I can get back to it. This matrix A is our matrix. We don't know if it has an inverse or not at this point. We go through the steps. 
And the time the, this time when the third pivot pops out, we know there are pivots all the way down uh, the matrix. There are three pivots in a three by three matrix, so it must actually be invertible. So that's the quick test for invertibility there. Um, now the next uh, question is, what is the inverse? Now, um, so we've got this pivot to kill everything above it. We've got to get this pivot to kill everything above it. So we need a minus a one of this row added to that row to kill what's above that pivot. And now um, that gives us, okay, so minus this to this is still one, minus this to this is zero, minus that to that is zero, minus minus one is a one added to that's a one, minus minus one is one added to that is two, um, and then minus minus one, uh, minus one is one added to, minus one added to zero is minus one. Then the second row doesn't change, and the third row doesn't change. And so now we have, um, if we look at it, a picture of what we have here, if I've got it all right, um, then uh, you can see that this guy is, there's an identity matrix there, and that's an A inverse there because we know by the general theory that if this becomes the identity, then this must be A inverse. If this part has become the identity, the A has turned into the identity, then the identity must have turned to the A inverse. So what we've done is we started with A and identity matrix and we worked our way down and we got to identity and something, which must therefore be A inverse. If this hadn't become the identity, then this wouldn't have become A inverse, there wouldn't be an inverse. And so that's from our general theory. So some other um, basic facts about inverses, now that we know how to find them, um, is an obvious fact is that the inverse of the inverse is the original matrix because it goes back to what it, you know, to reverse the process of the, of the matrix and then reverse it again. Um, also, by the same idea that if uh, it, it goes about by, by inverting the operation of multiplying by the matrix, if you invert a product, you uh, take the product of the inverses in the opposite order because to undo first doing B and then doing A, you have to undo the A and then undo the B. You have to go in the backwards order. So to undo A times, for, first do B, then do A. Remember this is what this is the operation that applied to a vector X would first do B on X and then do A on X. So if you think of it that as, a, as an operation, first do B, then do A, to reverse the process, you have to undo the A and then undo the B. So you can see that. Um, and of course, this is if these inverses exist. Um, and um, similarly, if you had a power, by applying this thing many times over with B equal to A, you get that A inverse to the minus one um, is simply A to the minus one to the n, if the inverse exists. Um, and uh, and then um, similarly, if if you have a number, it's a number, uh, not a matrix. And then you multiply by a matrix, and try and invert. Then of course you you reverse the process by 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 by, by reversing the process of multiplying by this number. And to reverse the process of multiplying by a number means to divide by that number. And so you get this guy. Um, so very straightforward. Not so not so obvious. This one is not really all that obvious. Um, a is invertible uh, if and only if A transpose is invertible. So that's actually a fairly deep fact. And also uh, A transpose inverse is A inverse transpose. Those are not obvious at all. Um, and so we wouldn't expect to just see that fall out. In the next lecture, we'll look at the operations that we carried out in the, in the reduced row echelon process. We were allowed, our, we allowed ourselves to, uh, to carry out certain transformations of a matrix step by step to, get, to do the, the elimination. Um, those processes, it's, it turns out, are actually carried out by multiplying by certain special matrices called elementary matrices. And we'll work out what those elementary matrices are, understand their theory, and use that to give rise to a general decomposition theorem or factorization theorem of matrices that expresses the whole process of, of row echelon or reduced row echelon in one single matrix equation involving matrix multiplication.